partial funding for the production of New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation. This week on New Mexico in Focus, does a new report placing New Mexico dead last in child well-being mean change is in store or more of the same? These are terrible statistics for our state and you know, we used to have that joke, thank God for Mississippi, now they have the joke, thank God for New Mexico, because mm -hmm. we're... Someone who had just lynched a black... Plus, man. a holiday weekend highlight reel as we look back at some of the year's best interviews. New Mexico in Focus starts now. In the past few months, we've enjoyed some fantastic interviews here on the show. So this week, we're bringing back three of them. We'll hear from legendary journalist Richard Stolle about his time working for Life magazine during the Civil Rights Movement. New Mexican author John Nichols talks about his life's work, his latest work, and living in northern New Mexico. And we'll look back at our chat with Roger Cook of the original do-it-yourself show, Ask This Old House. We begin with the Lion Opinion panel, though, as the group looks at the implications of falling to the bottom in one ranking of how states take care of their children. Just when you thought it could only get better, New Mexico teetering on the brink of the bottom of the annual Kids Count rankings of childhood well-being among the states is now 50th. We used to be 49th. This is an issue of all sorts of implications from the simple health of our children to the economic development health of our state. Here to talk about it from the New Mexico Green Chamber of Commerce, Laura Sanchez. Political reporter from the Albuquerque Journal, Jim Monteleone is here. From the New Mexico Watchdog website, Rob Nicoleski. And from the Capitol Bureau of the Texas New Mexico Newspapers Partnership, Mylon Simonich. Mylon, is there meat to this report? And what I mean by that, in taking off the street language, is this enough to spur action? We go from 49th to 50th, but there's something about dead last that means something more than almost dead last. I agree. I, I think when you, the joke in, in political circles is, well, at least we're ahead of Mississippi, and now in this survey we're not. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so it got probably more attention on that on that basis. Whether it leads to some sort of movement mm -hmm. politically is another matter. Let's stay right there with that. There's been efforts, certainly. To inc I mean, we can go across the board. We've talked about at this table, ch early childhood education, whatever the case may be for kids and kids' welfare, does not seem to make it through certain parts of our legislature, certain committees, things of that nature. What's your sense, your reporter's sense from covering the Roundhouse about why certain things don't happen to increase more funding for kids in our state? Well, the uh, constitutional amendment to increase early childhood education funding, Senator John Arthur Smith from Deming did not like that bill and it didn't get a hearing in his committee. It moved along other places. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the senator told me that it would not have received approval, but it didn't get a vote. Right. He's a key guy that the Democratic legislators, as these guys know, frequently would have weekly news conferences and they'd talk that bill up, but John Arthur was never there. Right. Interesting. Laura, I, I'm sure you were just like most folks reading this report, the sh percentage of kids who are not in preschool in our state, it's pretty staggering. That's a lot of kids who are not getting that critical early jump on all kinds of things, not just reading and writing, but social, socialization that happens at that age for kids, mm -hmm. a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. So take that one specifically. That's, that's a pretty damning part of this report. It is, and it, you know, it comes on the heels also of another report on childhood hunger. Ah. And we were ranked you know, the highest in that as well. Right. Um, there are, these are terrible statistics for our state. And you know, we used to have that joke, thank God for Mississippi. Now they have the joke, thank God for New Mexico, because mm -hmm. we're, we're worse than they are. And it's terrible. And it's going to take serious leadership. And I know that this governor had talked about um, you know, childhood education, you know, K through 12 issues, obviously had some education related bills, but this needs a lot more leadership. And mm -hmm. I think as a community, as a state, both parties, we have to figure out how to right this ship. How would that leadership look to you? Who, who is that and what are they saying that would spur people to action here? Well, I mean, this is, this is a very important report. I think it's key to showing that, you know, what we, what we have been afraid has been happening is in fact happening, right. that we're getting worse mm -hmm. and that we're providing even less resources to the most vulnerable communities. Um, and I think that's an important discussion to have, not just in the committee, not just when there's a bill in front of somebody, but in the interim. Mm -hmm. We have to do a lot more, I think as a community, we have to do a lot more outreach to these key decision makers to you know, change the way that they're looking at these expenditures as just another, mm -hmm. you know, just another budget item. I mean, these have widespread um, impacts, and I think they have long-term impacts. We're talking about a, a declining workforce, a less educated, you know, much sicker workforce. Mm -hmm. We have 
widespread problems that are going to be happening if we don't do something about it earlier on. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's key, is just educating people in the interim. That makes sense. Well, when we talk about serious leadership, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree that, that education is important. But if we're going to talk about serious leadership, I think we also have to start talking about par parents. Okay. And mm -hmm. are parents doing enough in this state? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think there is, it's politically incorrect to say, but I think there are a lot of parents in this state who do not value education, and they do not pass that value on to their kids. We have a terrible problem with truancy. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a single parent, you, if, and even if you don't know if Johnny or Janie skipped school, if the mm -hmm. school is telling you Johnny and Janie skipped school today, you need to step up, and I think that that has to be part of this mm -hmm. because let me, let me some, let me the government can help, mm -hmm. but ultimately it's your responsibility to raise your kids. I'm glad you got that last bit of, about government can help. Uh, our colleague Megan Kemmerich, who hosts our Public Square series here at New Mexico PBS, has had some programs about this very idea, and one of them is to supply help to parents in home mm -hmm. to teach them the skills about how to care, literally, about things like early childhood education, preschool, the importance of it. Is that a proper role for government to supply programs to go into homes and help parents become sure. better parents? If, if, if the only, I think like a lot of taxpayers, you want, we're, we're open to or I'm open to anything that's going to work. Right. As long as it works. And uh, we spend a lot of money in this state on education. Mm -hmm. According to the NEA, this isn't some far right outfit, the mm -hmm. NEA, New Mexico spends is 25th on per pupil spending, yet we're finishing 48th, 49th, and 50th in results. Mm -hmm. We spend money in this state, we just have to spend it wisely. And the question that always comes up, Jim, is are we spending enough? If we've got a billion dollar problem, we need to spend a, a, a lot of money to fix a billion dollar problem. You know, getting back, and Mylon was talking about this mm -hmm. earlier, I mean, sometimes there's hesitancy in the legislature because it looks like, when you look at the problem, it looks like a never-ending pit. Right. Um, that money can just, you can throw money at it, and similar to, I mean, the per pupil um, financial data. I mean, we have been putting lots of money at it, mm -hmm. and we haven't seen results. To say that a new report from the Annie, Annie Casey Foundation is going to, you know, finally marking us last is going to spur action, I think is disingenuous, mm -hmm. considering the fact this foundation puts out this report every year, and we've been bouncing around the bo bottom for a long time. Um, it's not a surprise or news to anyone in this mm -hmm. state that mm -hmm that we struggle with these issues, but we're still mm -hmm. struggling to move forward. Let me play devil's advocate a little bit, and that, and the idea of how much is enough money to spend, what gets results. We're 25th on that ranking, with the result being 49th or 50th, somewhere around there. But you look at states that have a high level, level of education, and the idea that they look at, at early childhood education as an investment versus a line item. Is that part of the problem here, that we're looking at the money perhaps in, in, a, in a way that's not quite accurate? Because what's the matter with investing in kids a little bit more if the result is perhaps we sneak up to 38th, 37th, 35th, if we spend, if we're at 19th in spending, so we increase our spending? W what's the problem with that? I don't think there's a problem with that, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's true that whether you call it an investment or an expense, it still goes to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you have a group of, of legislators in Santa Fe that are trying to make sure that bottom line adds up year after year and to make sure that we've got the financial security to do other things like economic develop, development or other, other necessary programs in the state of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that there aren't many people that see great tremendous value in, in those, that early childhood investment. Sure. Um, but the money has to come from somewhere mm -hmm. and we need to have a better understanding of, of how we can fund it long term sustainably. Sure. sure and these arguments come up in the legislature all the time don't they this is what you they listen do. to and yeah the, the big issue is do we take money out of the large state endowments right. and put them into early child edu childhood education and the the proponents of that say that's going to keep more people out of prison it's going mm -hmm. to uh, reduce our costs of juvenile delinquency it's going to put more people on the path to good jobs who will be big taxpayers and there's merit in all of that the, the hesitancy uh, is always that if we hit that fund too hard, those endowments are going to sink, and, and down the road, we are going to be hurting in other areas. Mm -hmm. So um, if we knew 
back 100 years ago, what we know now about early childhood development, we probably would have funded it differently mm -hmm. with those endowments from extraction industries. Mm -hmm. But you've heard this, I want to stay with you on this. You've heard this idea about investment in that word, investment in our kids early on. People, some people call it an economic development type of, a, of angle. You should be looking at these things. When that comes up in committee, what's the general sense of how legislators, legislators hear that? Is there a block to hearing things about investment in kids? Well, it's not monolithic. Okay. Some, some people are very open to that idea that if we put more money into small children going into the homes, that's one of the, the toeholds of these programs, showing people how to parent, getting them on the right track, we get all the success, then we're going to have kids who are successes. We're not going to have as many kids in jails. We won't have to keep building prisons. We won't have to ha uh, worry about having uh, probation officers for juveniles. All those arguments come up, but there's also a, a strong set of people mm -hmm. there who say, I don't want to raid those endowments right. to this level. Right, and they happen to have position. <laughs> well, that, either they have position right. or uh, <clears throat> I even if you were to get it to a floor vote, I'm yeah. not sure it would pass. Interesting, okay, interesting. Interesting, right yeah. Interesting there. Um, go back to your early point: the costs of health issues that come up when you're young that are lifelong. You have to deal with. We have childhood diabetes is a huge problem in our state. Just simply teaching people how to feed their kids better, exercise, all that kind of thing. Again, same question as to Rob. I think I know where you're going on this. A proper role for government, proper role for the community to be in people's homes to show them. Are we at a bad enough state where this is one of the answers? Absolutely, know? and yeah. I think it takes, you know, it's more than just government. I think it's government. I think there's definitely um, a gap to be filled by foundations, private investment. And I know that, you know, the Kellogg Foundation has targeted New yes. Mexico to be one of those states mm -hmm. um, and others. And, and then there's also, there's a role to be played by the private sector mm -hmm. also to you know, look at this problem and try to create opportunities um, to help wherever we can. But I think there's also, you know, there's, there's the early childhood problem, but we also are a state that suffers from a, a high teenage pregnancy rate. Yes. So we have a lot yeah. of children, essentially, you know, youngsters having children. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have a huge population where, you know, by the time you're 40, you're already a grandparent. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there's just a, a huge, you know, cultural problem too, mm -hmm. is people, we're not catching folks young enough where they, they feel there are other opportunities and they, you know, maybe don't need to make the decisions to go the route of having a family and starting right. to have children so early because there's an economic cost to that. Sure. There's a quality of life cost to that. Sure. So I think it's both early childhood, but there's also a lot of education going on in terms of um, providing opportunities. As well as intervention, right. if you want to use that word from what you talk, we were talking yeah. about with the home, home To me, the, so another yeah. thing too is that uh, you know, this, this was a, an interesting study to read. Uh, mm -hmm. it didn't, I don't think it surprised anybody who's right. been halfway paying attention to what's going on in the state. Um, like but the, but the, um, it didn't, and, 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 and it's not really a criticism of the, of the foundation or, or the foundation's report is mm -hmm. why? Why do we have alcohol problems? Right. Why are there drug problems? Yeah. Why are there so many teenage pregnancies? And I think mm -hmm. you know that might go back to what we're talking, what I was talking about about parent res you know, responsibility. We'll, we'll pull it back and look at all of it at some point. Now we'll be back with more of the line next week in a moment. Journalist for Time and Life magazines, Richard Stolle. My shtick has always been in my father's, my grandfather's, is simply to be really, really um, aware of the web of life that sustains us and how we fit into it. Um, and that should lead, theoretically, right, to leading a life that makes way less of a carbon imprint on the planet. Richard Stolle has spent a lifetime as one of the nation's foremost journalists as a reporter for Life magazine, Stolle immersed himself in the incendiary politics of the South during the civil rights struggle and the battle for integration. And he was also the man who bought the Zabruder film for Life magazine shortly after the John F. Kennedy assassination, a tale you can find online at our YouTube page. Here's NMF correspondent Gwyneth Dolan with Richard Stolle. Dick Stolle, thank you for being with us here today. My pleasure. I want to start off by talking a little bit about your time covering the civil rights era. Um, you were uh, posted down in the South in the late 1950s, and I heard you speak recently about an, instant, an incident that stuck in my mind. Take us to Charlotte, North Carolina in 1956 and the integration 
of the high school there. One very young, tall black girl integrated that high school. Usually the NAACP would send in three or four, so there would be some sense of camaraderie. And this, one girl and, and a high school, they usually went into elementary schools. High school meant teenagers, it meant sex, it meant all the problems that uh, white Southerners saw among blacks. This girl walked up and boys began surrounding her. The security there was very lax. The uh, Charlotte police were back sort of in the shadows and these boys ran up to her and began spitting. And I was standing or walking right behind her and I suddenly realized that the two of us were being inundated with this teenage spit. I have to say it was one of the most disgusting experiences I've ever seen. But for her, this was her, their classmate coming in, being covered head to foot. She had a pretty dress which was getting wet because of the spit. It was a horrifying experience. And that Dorothy Counts, this young, pretty girl, had this look of absolute pride, defiance that she wasn't even going to look that the boys were spitting on her. It was an extraordinary experience, but very costly. Three or four days later, she dropped out and went to another school out of state. You told us another story in Santa Fe recently about uh, being in, I think it was Tennessee, after a lynching. That was in Mississippi. In Mississippi. When you say lynching, think Mississippi, <laughs> not so much Tennessee. Poplarville, Mississippi, the, uh, uh, they incarcerated a black man with um, charges of attempted rape, I think it was, which was ridiculous. I, it, 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 there may have been some kind of menacing. He was drunk is what happened. And a mob came into the jail that night, up to the second floor, pulled him up by his legs, his head banging on the steps because next day when we covered it, you could still see the blood stains on the steps. And they took him out to the Pearl River. They were going to castrate him, but a car came along at that moment. So they shot him in the head and threw him into the Pearl River. And we arrived there the next day. And within two or three days, the FBI, which came in after the press, Southerners hated the press, but they hated the FBI even more. You tend to look like an FBI because you always wore a coat and tie. They solved it. They solved the, the, uh, the mystery. They knew who did it. Um, and there were never any indictments whatsoever. You couldn't get an indictment for that kind of crime then. Now, witnessing this stuff firsthand, you were a reporter for Life magazine, so you had to write these stories and you had photographers with you. One of the principles of journalism is objectivity. Um, but you must have had very complex feelings. Was it hard to try to strive for objectivity? Well, when you were trying to interview someone who had just lynched a black man, um, it was a little hard to be object, object, uh, attain objectivity, but you had to be courteous because they wouldn't talk to you otherwise. I mean, they hated Life magazine because we not only told what happened, we ran pictures of what happened, and it was extraordinarily mortifying for them and for other Southerners. But the objectivity, Life magazine then had an editorial page, so we could say on the editorial page, how we felt about the integration of public schools, and we were for it. But when you went out, you, you would find people who, who were in, in the South, and it was one of the fascinating things about working in the South. The Southerners were very torn about this. And uh, I used to call them the, the good Southerners and the bad Southerners. And there were a lot more good Southerners that were bad. The bads were the ones who went into the jail. The goods you read about it in Life magazine the next week and were humiliated by the news. So the objectivity was 
even in the worst of circumstances, like the stories I've described, was to show what happened, but don't make it, don't inflame it with words, don't inflame it with pictures that made it worse than it was. It, I think journalists have a sense of fairness about them, or they, don't, they got out of the business, I think. And that was what we always tried to tell ourselves, we had to be fair. That's not always the same as objective, but we had to be fair. We had to show the other side of it, which we did. And I knew in the end, the good people of the South were going to win, and they did. You, did you have a sense at the time, I mean, obviously you knew these were important stories and life invested a lot of time and manpower and money in covering these things, but did you realize at the time the impact of, of what was happening or did it dawn on you later? We knew it at the time. I mean, uh, when I was down there, I look back at those four years down there as having changed my life, but when I was down there, uh, I mean, we're in Poplarville, Mississippi, and, and, and a lynching is taking place. And I said, this is going to be news all over the world, that there has been another lynching in Mississippi. And uh, we have to cover this. We have to cover it well and fairly and all the rest. Oh, I, I, I knew what we were on to, and we were living in the South. Other publications, networks and all, they'd parachute people in for the big stories. We lived there. We lived among Southerners. We had to justify ourselves on weekend parties among Southerners. And uh, it was a life-changing experience. And I knew every minute of the time I was down there that my life was being changed. Do you think there's an equivalent story of, of this era right now? Not one that captures the imagination of of the country and in many ways the world. Um, I mean, many great stories and all the rest, but uh, now again, I was in the South and for, for us it was the all-consuming story. A lot of things were going on in the rest of America that, uh, uh, but there isn't that, there isn't that story that captures the, the morality of the country in a way that race does. Race is, is the American story in the world. And uh, it's been the story of America from the beginning. It, and in many ways, it still is. And that the de uh, desegregation of the public schools was a huge kind of rallying point. And, um, how there's, does, n there's nothing that I'm aware of now that, that, that captures that kind of attention. How does immigration compare? Immigration has so many, I mean, down here, we think of immigration, we think of Hispanics. That, as far as we're concerned, that's the only immigration story there is. You go to the Northeast, they're getting immigrants from, from Europe and, and their attitude toward it. Is is totally different, and um, uh, it, in some ways, being in the Southwest and the immigration story he, now, in some ways, captures public attention the way the uh, school situation in the South did when I was down there. It doesn't have quite the sort of constitutional and moral implications that uh, integration did. You know, back in this time that we're talking about, Life was a weekly magazine with huge circulation, very well known for these in-depth stories and coverage and stunning photography. But, um, you know, it's gone now. And we, uh, we have a, a very different media landscape we have. Uh, we still have big newspapers and big television stations that were around them, but we, now we have Twitter and we have, uh, you know, eyewitness accounts from cell phones on YouTube. And we have online news organizations and blogs and things like that. Are these folks, the journalists of today, are they doing justice to the major stories of our time? Sometimes. The professional journal, the problem, 
I mean, th this, the idea that everybody is a journalist today, baloney. No, you're not, folks. You're not. You and I are, and, and many others. But we understand what journalism means. Citizen journalists um, often simply want to get something off their mind. That's perfectly OK. Everybody is a publisher in many ways today. But not everybody is a journalist. A journalist is someone who takes his or her job seriously, who strives for accuracy and the truth and fairness and checking and wants to make sure if it goes out there with his or her name on it or not, that it is as true as we can make it. And that kind of obligation and dedication is not as current and as much out there as I wish it were. There are a lot of reasons to be pessimistic about the state of journalism now. You know, there are many, many, many fewer jobs than there were, fewer outlets. We have fewer people covering the stories that we all know are important, and the finances of the industry are looking dim. Are there things that you see out there now that give you hope, that you see as positive uh, steps that can do it justice or save us all? Well, you're here. That's <laughs> one thing. Um, well, I'm mostly, I've worked on newspapers and, and certainly done television, but I'm in the magazine business. Magazine business has, uh, was facing obliteration 10 years ago. It's beginning to come back. I mean, magazines are born and, and die. That's going to happen no matter wh what we do. And, but magazines, through print and through their digital efforts, the fact is, in magazine business, 87% of the money that magazine makes comes from print. So you cannot kiss off print, because that's, that's where the dough is coming from. But you have to move into the digital side, into the tablets and handheld, even into laptops, although that's the handheld is what's taking over now. You've got to be conscious that a whole new generation is coming up that may not want to read print, but they're going to read, or they're going to, they're going to absorb information, and we have to figure out how to, to bring that absorption about. And if it's like this, then we have got to do the news on this. If it's tablets, that. But, and the magazine, and the whole journalism business is, is doing an extraordinary job. I mean, they were, we were fumbling around 10 years ago. We're not anymore. We know what needs to be done, and we know how to do it, and we ask for patience and the resources to do it because the American people are going to suffer if we don't. You know, speaking of, of uh, pessimism and obstacles, and we just have about one minute left, but I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the Obama administration's uh, request for all these phone records from the Associated Press. How does this strike you, especially as someone who lived through the Nixon era as a reporter? I am absolutely outraged. I, what, what the hell is Obama doing? I mean, he used to preach transparency and, and First Amendment and freedom of the press and all the rest. And now he's going after journalists in a way that no other American president has ever done. Come on, Obama, calm down. This is the one business that the hard-headed businessmen and farmers in 1776, the one business that they wanted to have constitutional protection for. And that's why the First Amendment is there. Mr. Obama, read the First Amendment again, please. As a constitutional professor, you'd think he'd, he'd have it memorized. Dick Stolle, thank you so much for being with us here today. And uh, for those of you watching, there will be a little bit more of this on our website. The best thing I do with people is I say, take advantage of free water, the water that comes off your roof. That's it's right. great. Collect it, a rain barrel, a cistern in the ground, all will supply you water that you can sure. drop a pump in. And, and during the hot times of the year, you have free water. Sure. And they can't stop you from using that. John Nichols has made a life writing books and taking pictures in his beloved New Mexico. 
And of course, Nichols broke through years ago with his novel, The Milagro Bean Field War. It's become a staple of literature classes across the country. His latest offering, On Top of Spoon Mountain, is a novel about a man in a similar stage of life as Nichols. But as NMAF producer Matt Grubbs found out, it's no thinly veiled autobiography. John Nichols, thanks for coming in. We'll start with On Top of Spoon Mountain. Um, what gave rise to this book? What was in your head um, when you decided this is something I want to write about? What was in my head when I started writing about it? Probably nothing. <laughs> it's like I started trying to write a really, really big book um, that incorporated everything but the kitchen sink. And, and um, I began writing it in 2000 and wrote about 1,300 pages, a 1,400 page first draft. And I wasn't really thinking very straight. And what I was trying to do was to write about how convoluted and complicated and impossible one modern day life is. Two, how we're destroying the planet. Three, how climate change is changing everything. You know. Four, how climax capitalism is uh, basically wrecking you know, the planet's economy and all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to do it by showing the life of a single individual uh, just going to um, hell in a handbasket. And obviously I didn't have a real good plan, except that I knew at the very end of the book that this guy would try and climb a mountain to get back to his human origins. The main character, Jonathan Kepler, Kepler. Um, he seems to be somewhat self-aware. I mean, he, even as he sort of maybe veers into the ridiculous, he, he knows that that's where he's going. Is that planned? And is there an element of that that it's just sort of self-fulfilling? Like we may, we may be self-aware, but we can't keep ourselves from being ourselves. We're just going to do what we've always done. Duh. I mean, it's <laughs> like, you know, humanity, we know that we're destroying the planet. We know that growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. We know that if we keep on building more cars, if China keeps on building more cars, you know, if the world keeps proceeding at the rate we're proceeding, that we're going to self-destruct. I mean, if you're sitting there smoking four packs of cigarettes a day, you know. I mean, there is evidence from, from, uh, from various scientists, you know, in the U.S. government and the little warning on the packets that if you smoke four packs of cigarettes a day, you're doomed, right? <laughs> Something bad is going to happen. So, yeah, we're all aware. I mean, every time we get into our um, 2012 SUVs, right? And, turn on the ignition switch and drive to the station to go to work, right? We know that this particular lifestyle isn't really going to last forever without enormous consequences, right? So, so yeah, I'm, I'm imbuing my character with maybe a little more self-awareness than you'd like. But, yeah, he understands how he screwed up his life. He understands how, how the world around him is screwed up. He understands what's happening to the world that he lives in. And despite the fact that we know, that most of us know, that the planet knows, uh, the human community knows what we're doing to ourselves and to the earth, we just, we keep doing it. It's really, really hard to disengage and figure out another way to do it. So Kepler is, is 65, right, in, in the novel? No, he's going to be 65. Oh, okay. At the, and the, the last pages of the novel. Oh, that's right. He's 64. 64. <laughs> and so, 300. So you started this in 2000. And, right. And at that time, you're just getting into your 60s, mm -hmm. and you're, you're looking forward at this guy. By the time you finish, you, you've passed him up. Um, did his age and his perspective on life, did that kind of grow as you got older or did you kind of come up on him and then pass him by no no it's like i mean everyone will say this is autobiographical novel and jonathan kepler is just like you right the fact of the matter is that for the last 40 years i've climbed those mountains relentlessly 
you know, day and night. It's like I never fell off the wagon and got out of shape or whatever. I mean, I've fished the Rio Grande Gorge for 40 years, you know, going down steep bajadas and over boulders to do it. And I've climbed in the, in the high mountains, you know, up to 13,000 feet regularly since, since I was in my mid-50s. And uh, so I was never pining to climb a mountain when I, on my 65th birthday, uh, because I was climbing, you know, high mountains. The day before like, your 65th The day before, <laughs> my, and, and a week before, and two weeks before, and sure, a month before. Sure. I mean, uh, actually from the age of 60 on, I went nuts and, and, and spent maybe two or three days a week up in the tundra, you know, above 12,000 feet. And um, I have two million photographs and, and, and incredible field notes about that. So, so I sort of invented Jonathan Kepler's dilemma. Okay. Right. And in that, in that respect, this guy is a lot different than, than I was during the writing of the book. I was just trying to figure out how to write a book. <laughs> you know? I wasn't trying to figure out how to climb the mountain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that part you knew. Yeah, I knew that part. What do you get out of being up there in the tundra and uh, up by Williams Lake and Wheeler Peak and what I Lobo get out Peak? Of it. Yeah. What does it bring oh, you? Oh, it just it brings me a euphoria. It, it's um, First of all, it's an area that other people don't go to very much. They go to Wheeler Peak. Wheeler Peak is the tallest mountain in New Mexico, so it's a magnet. And um, everybody that climbs up to Williams Lake from the Towski Valley, and there may be 200 of them a day that do that, right? They all get sucked onto Wheeler Peak because that's the mythological peak, right? If you take one step west, toward Lake Fork Peak or Spoon Mountain or Sentinel Crag or Catherine Overlook or any of any of the hills in that basin. It's a relatively limited basin. You meet nobody. <laughs> and I spent about eight years just climbing around that basin, avoiding Wheeler Peak. Um, like eight or nine years, maybe I met six people. Six people. <laughs> um, in all those years, I just learned where I could go. There's no trails, and where I could be alone, and where I could really observe everything from the weather to. I became a fanatic for bighorn sheep. You know, I carried a spotting scope. It's real interesting. I read a lot of books. I befriended the, the bighorn biologists in New Mexico, you know. But I also observed all the migratory birds, the wildlife. I learned the botany. So my shtick has always been in my father's, my grandfather's, is simply to be really, really um, aware of the web of life that sustains us and how we fit into it. Um, and that should lead, theoretically, right, to leading a life that makes way less of a carbon imprint on the planet, you know. Those themes seem to run throughout a number of your books. Have you found, as, as you've been writing for the last half century, that um, your themes have changed, or you, do you keep circling back to familiar territory intentionally or unintentionally? No, I mean, you know, they say every writer keeps writing the same, rewriting the same story, yeah. right? You just, and uh, there's also a shibboleth that there's only five stories on earth, and everybody keeps rewriting them, you know? And, and uh, so obviously there's um, a lot. Um, in this book, on top of Spoon Mountain, that you could find, and at least you could find it, and from Milagro Beanfield War on, you know, all the time that I've lived in New Mexico. Sure, they always um, they, they they everyone who knows about writing. <laughs> you people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm in college. I'm sitting in a um, a creative writing class, and my professor says, "Write what you know." Mm -hmm. And when we when we last saw John Nichols in our Artisodes episode. Right. Um, you talked about writing about what you're interested in. Yeah. Do you, are you aware of where those two points intersect, where you're kind of interested in one thing, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I, I know plenty about this. I can write about it. Yeah, it's also if you don't know anything about it, you can write about it. I mean, that's why God gave you an imagination. I mean, to write what you know, yeah, that's, a, that's good advice, right? But two is, um, you know, write, write about what you don't know, too. 
try and imagine it, learn about it, research it, whatever. Um, uh, you don't tell an actor um, uh, that's going to play, and the postman always rings twice, you know, that you have to have been in a plot with your mistress to kill her husband or whatever in order to play the part. You don't have to be a murderer in order to play the part of a murderer, you know, and you don't have to be a mountain climber to write about mountain climbing. I mean, that's, that's, that's my theory, and I'm, I'm sure... So, so, yeah, it's good advice to write what you know, but, but, but on, on the second hand, it's real good advice to use your imagination, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Maurice Sendak didn't run around in the jungle, you know, and <laughs> talk to lions and tigers and weird alien furry creatures, you know, in oh, order to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, use your imagination. Sure. To, sure. to also... Society seems fascinated with like the J.D. Salingers and the Harper Lees, these people who write this great book and then they're mm. like, I'm done, you know, I'm done yeah. with it. And that certainly hasn't been you, you've kept writing, but, but you said to us that you didn't want to write, you know, Abbott and Costello meet the Milagro Beanfield no. War or the Milagro Beanfield War and the Goblet of Fire or uh, whatever it is. Right. Um, is, that, is that conscious? Would you feel like a sellout if you had, if you had kept doing that? No, it's just my shtick. You know, I mean, I sort of feel that, that, how do I feel? I feel sort of like, okay, everything I write during a lifetime will just all fit into a, a single, single frame, a single ball. And that, okay, you write the Milagro Beanfield War, you write the Sterile Cuckoo, you write the Magic Journey, you write American Blood, you write An Elegy for September, you write Conjugal Bliss, and these books move around. But they're all just parts of things that interest me, you know, that obviously are triggered by my own life story or by everything else that I read. And that, um, you don't need to just keep, you try not to keep re-saying the same book every time you figure out, okay, I, I wrote a book about growing beans, now I'm going to write a book about catching fish, you know, and I, then I'm going to write a book about climbing mountains, you know, then I'm going to write a book about how marriage sucks, you know, or whatever. And, but it, it's all part of experience that has interested me, and in the end, all the books together will be some kind of a whole, and they'll all be related to each other because it's just me doing it. You know, it's my personality, obnoxious, whatever, <laughs> plodding along every book. But they'll all fit into just a single picture or whatever. It's good to know there's more to come. Dad, there's always more to come. I mean, what, what else are you going to do? <laughs> right? John Nichols, thanks so much for coming in. We appreciate it. Thank you. Earlier this spring, the crew from Ask This Old House made a visit to New Mexico to shoot two episodes of the popular PBS program. Now, while the gang hammered and planted away, I stole a few moments with the show's resident outdoor expert, landscape architect, Roger Cook. New Mexico got a visit from the Ask This Old House crew this week. Our guest, landscaping pro, my personal hero, Roger Cook, in the company we're in, The Land of Enchantment. They're shooting material for two episodes of the popular program for broadcast later. Roger, thank you for being here. Welcome. My pleasure. Have you been to New Mexico previously? I have not. It's beautiful. The mountains are absolutely breathtaking. Nice. And as we tape this today, you've been working in Santa Fe. That's right. You zip down here to do that. What's your impression of Santa Fe? Uh, great town. Yeah. I really like it. I love the architecture. I love the people. Uh, it, it's laid back, but people are sharp. You know, yeah. it's good. Good, good call right there. Let's get right to it. I'm so curious, I have to ask you, how did you get into landscaping? What was the first thing you did? I, uh, I, worked, I graduated from college and I worked in the woods with the kids for the summer and then that ended and my wife informed me, you will get a job. <laughs> so I answered an ad for landscape laborers and uh, my first job was pruning the ivy around the windows at Harvard University. No kidding. Yes, so you go up the 40 foot ladder, you trim, pick up your trimmings, go to the next one. So I lasted two days, and I went into the boss, and I said, listen, I want to work. I really want to work, but this isn't what I want to do. So he was a big gentleman. He said, you want to work, huh, kid? So he put me on the construction crew, and I started running machines. I started doing brick walks. I started transplanting trees. So five years, I had the best education at the world at a company called Frost and & Higgins. And then I Frost left and, and started sure. on my own. Interesting. You don't hear much about apprenticeship 
type things anymore. It doesn't sound like it was officially that way, but that's what you're describing. It was within yeah. a company. They, yeah. Back then, they had time to teach you. They took kids and they taught them how to be tree climbers. They taught me how to plant. They sent me to school, to various programs and stuff to learn different things. It was a great time. Now yeah. we're so caught up in turning over the money that we forget about educating people. That's a good point. We'll talk about that a little bit in a, in a, in a second. I, I appreciate that point right there. Let's talk about something that we deal with here in the Southwest quite a bit, and, and I always appreciate an outside eye on these things. That is water usage. Mm -hmm. One of the struggles we've been having as uh, homeowners here is our own re personal responsibilities to our own water usage, certainly. But part, of, part and parcel of that is landscaping water usage for plants, and also replacing irrigation systems, which is part of the project you're doing here in Albuquerque right, as well. The first project we're doing yeah. was putting in a drip irrigation system. Mm -hmm. But what I say to people to make them think about water is every drop counts, uh -huh. every little bit. Back home, I die when I'm driving down the street and a sprinkler system's going on and it's raining out. Down out here, you guys have water running down the street, but the difference is you can get fined for it That's here. Right. That's right. We, get, we have to learn to balance our lives so that we are conserving water as best we can between low flow toilets, between recycling roof water, just in planting and doing plantings in a way that they don't demand a lot of water. Mm -hmm. The technology of these systems, let me stick, stick with irrigation for a second because that's the project up in the heights that you guys are doing here. Um, there's a lot of legacy systems out there and it stops people from taking that next step for new technology. What can you tell folks about the fear factor of changing out an irrigation system. Is it as big as some people think it is? Is it difficult? What's the deal there? It, it all depends on the system and how it was put in, but the rewards are great. Mm -hmm. Even changing to these new clocks with all the, the clock we put in yesterday is called a smart clock. It, it, we put in the zip code, so it knows your weather cycles, it knows how much moisture you get a year, it checks temperature, and it blends all those together and it tells it the, the system when to water. It could be a Wednesday, and the lawn says, I need water. The clock says, no, the weatherman's telling me it's going to rain on Thursday. You're not going to get water. We're going to wait and let, let it rain on Thursday, and then we'll supplement it after that. So it's a great way of saving water. Can you run these things remotely? Or can you, can you check on them? Can, what's the, what's the, the access for the homeowner? It's just like a regular panel, a regular clock for an irrigation system, except wow. they've built in all these new things. Interesting. Now, I, I, I've heard tell that there are ways to put these things together that's not like the old days. You had the, the can of glue that you'd run around the inside and twist them together. Oh, that's a bad joint. I got to get it out. And you've got different materials for joints and things. Has that era pretty much passed? Can a homeowner actually take these things on now? 90% of it is all going to be push on or clamp on on poly pipe. No more of the rigid pipe. And we even the drip irrigation is called funny pipe because it's funny because you can bend it around anything you want. You sure. don't need very many couplings. And when you do, you just cut, turn the coupling in, and you're done. No glue, very few clamps. It's very wow. easy for a homeowner to work with. That's a new, that's a new era right there. That's interesting. Uh, plant use and xeriscaping scaping obviously is a big part of that water management. Uh, there's a couple of different elements there. There's the original design, you know, what, where plants go where for what kind of appeal on your lawn, right. getting the water to it at the appropriate amount you just handled. But let's talk about xeriscaping and how it looks. A lot of folks still like the idea of a green patch of lawn, even in the Southwest. And, you know, personal tastes aside, is there a way to get something that feels green and lush and full in a desert climate using very lo little water for you? Native plants. Ah. The, the key to an area like this is using plants which grow in the desert. Right. They may not be the most beautiful of plants, but they are rugged. Right. And once you put them in and they get established, then you have spots of green in the yard that don't need excess water. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing, and, and it, it's really taken a leap of faith for me to do, and that's artificial turf. Ah. I've used it in a couple places at home. We've used it in dog areas where they can't, you can't grow grass. I've used it in shady areas and in little courtyards. I did one in the north end of Boston. Ah. No way to grow grass, but they had a couple kids in a very small area. We put down astroturf, fake turf. Hmm. Think about that, and I saw one on the way here. You could do a patch of green in your front yard mm -hmm. after, after, with the fake grass, mm -hmm. and it would work. It would look like grass, and no one would know except you. Sure. I've got a friend that's got a little bit, about 12 by 15 yeah. in his backyard. He actually practices hitting golf balls I was going to say, did he right. put a hole in it? <laughs> that's <Yeah>. right, exactly. <laughs> However, to confirm your point, he has had many yard parties where people didn't even realize it was uh, astroturf. The, I tell you, the new stuff, you cannot tell the way they've blended it mm -hmm. together. It's not just one color or one strand. 
all different heights on the strands and all different colors. It looks just like a natural lawn. That's interesting. Except no weeds. That's right. That's right. How about for flowers? You know, that's always a part of landscaping, as I recall in my time doing construction, where a shot of color strategically placed around yards could be just such an, an enormous help in, in things. You do this all the time with flower beds and things when we, we all watch the show. Yep. Same theory here in the Southwest? Um, not as much. Okay. Usually annuals and flowering plants like that require a lot of water. Okay. We're going to look at tough plant. We're going to look at perennials that'll flower. And we may do them in a container because then we can supply them with a good source of soil mm -hmm. and just have to water that one spot, mm -hmm. that container. You could carry out a jug of water and water it once or twice a week and they would do great. Right. Is there, you know, water issues, staying with that for another quick second, uh, it's, it's an issue everywhere when you think about it. It's not just a Southwest thing. What's your sense of how other people around the country who are, by the way, battling enormous amounts of water in the Midwest, back East, Southeast, trying to get rid of water is the goal as opposed, but is water management still starting to rise as a consciousness? Oh, thing? absolutely. You okay. just have to look at, we're building more and more houses, we're building more and more commercial buildings, we're building more and more demand on the water. Right. So we're all gonna have to conserve and. My, the best thing I do with people is I say, take advantage of free water, the water that comes off your roof. That's it's right. great. Collect That's it, right. a rain barrel, a cistern in the ground, all will supply you water that you sure. can drop a pump in. And, and during the hot times of the year, you have free water. Sure. And they can't stop you from using that. That's right. And also, not your bit, but more Tom Silva's or somebody else's, gray water management from your house. It, and that's rising as well, I would that's say. That's becoming huge, where the, right. the plumbing on a new house is set up for it right away, so right. you don't have to do any retrofitting. Mm -hmm. And it goes right out into a cistern, and it goes you know, right on the lawns. Sure. Now, the next step beyond that, which is tricky for some neighborhoods and some homeowners, is actually gray water that actually goes into a collection pond. The reeds are there just to get rid of the biodegradable right, stuff they, that's there. They do sure. their thing. They, they tie up anything that, that's in the water mm -hmm. and then it just leaves and it's nice and clean. Right. That's what a wetland does. That whole idea of a wetland where water pours in there, mm -hmm. it sits for a little while and then it leaves very slowly. Sure. And it's cleaned out by the plants that are there. Right. The whole other story of that is policy decisions and governmental decisions. Not your bit, but you know, I, I used to live somewhere. Somebody put out a cistern rain barrel collection. Mm -hmm. It was against code we were worked at, it went to court, and the, the tenant ended up winning, but this is part of the turnover in the consciousness sometimes. Somebody has to lead the charge yes. and do these kind of things. And you get to work with people who have obviously bought into these things. But on, on, in general terms, how do you see the acceptance of these new things nationwide? Is it rising? It's, it's what educational. Do we All yeah. it is is educational. Once people understand it, they don't fear it anymore. You know, yeah. we, we, we worry, we fear that someone's gonna take our rights away. But if you can get them to understand right. what you're doing and you're actually saving a valuable resource, it's a win. That's right. That's right. Interestingly, when you think about uh, the Southwest, we're, we're relying so much on snow runoff, snowpack. Everybody has to be in the game in the Southwest, that's for sure, including the drought. Where do you see us headed now for uh, the use of backyards, patios, outdoor fireplaces, just building another room outside seems to be another trend when I see, when I read it as well. My job is to drag you out of that house and out to the patio. <laughs> so if you have a, a sliding door going into the backyard and you open it up, all of a sudden you have a great room. You know, you don't have two little rooms, you have a great room. Right. And to get the kids out there, to get you out there, and everyone just enjoying what you live here for. You sure. live here to be outside. So that's, that's, right. that's what we do. Good stuff. One of the things you do also that I love is the importance of the entryway. Visually, two-dimensionally, that matches with the house and how a good bluestone entrance or stone... A lot of effort goes into that in some of the projects that you do. How important is that as a, as a curb appeal for any house, that, that entry, that leading to the threshold? It's the most important thing for people in the neighborhood, friends are coming, but more importantly for you, when you come home, you want to drive up to the house and go, boy, that really looks nice. Yeah. But it takes a lot of work to get that right. There's a lot of preparation that goes into doing a bluestone patio, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of it's done underneath. You pick the right plants for the right spot. Too many times, especially in New England, mm -hmm. we put in a plant this big, and in 10 years it's 15 feet tall, and you have to cut it down, or it's eating the house. The squirrels are using sure. it to get in the, in the attic. Yeah. Think ahead. The right plant for the right place. You're investing in a plant. It grows up nice on either side of the door. You have a couple pots on the stairs going up, and it's just beautiful. Interesting. Now it begs a question. Landscapers that I've talked to, one of the great frustrations 
is landscape design or landscape architecture, how to just get it on paper before the shovel even hits the ground. For you, is it, is it, is it an absolute must for any homeowner or is freestyling it okay too in some situations? Plans are a great tool for two reasons. First of all, you can see what you get and it allows me to price it. I can tell you exactly what that's going to cost. Mm -hmm. Number two is we all have these grand plans, but we can't afford to do them all. Right. But there's a way to cut it into phases so that when it's done, it all comes together nicely. It doesn't become mismatched or when you go to do phase three, you're running over right. phase one or something <laughs> like that. Some people have the ability to look at a house and see what they want uh, and express what they want. Right. Then we don't need to, to go to all lengths of a plan, but those people are few and far between. More often I get, oh, I didn't know it was gonna look like that on the paper. <laughs> so you really have to educate people that having a plan is, an is one of the essential tools of having a good landscape. There you go. One of the companies that you're working with here in Albuquerque is Hilltop Landscaping. Yeah, great guys. They are interesting, aren't they? Tell me about your impressions of them in working with, as you do these shows, working with local subcontractors. Well, I worked with Lucas, who's been with him, I believe, 30 years, wow. he said. You know, and it's just incredible when you meet a man who's been with one company that long a period of time. Says a lot about the company. Yeah, sure. It, says it, it sure does. And, but Lucas is so calm. He didn't get excited about everything. We put him through the hoops. We, we drove him absolutely crazy. Filming isn't an easy thing to do. So we drove him crazy, but he never got excited, just took everything in stride yeah. and had a big smile on his face. Just a great guy. And that's one of the things I'm so lucky is I get to go all over the country and meet people who have a passion like I do for landscaping in the outside. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a thrill. It also takes a good customer. And Nick, and I forget his wife's uh, uh, name, the, the Chelsea here in Albuquerque, Chelsea, Nick and Chelsea. She was in on the filming. Yeah. He was in on the filming on yeah. day one, that, which is part of what you guys do. You get the homeowner involved. I did not realize, though, before going up to the site and watching you guys tape, that the demands on the homeowner to stay in stride with you on take after take after take, that's not something people do normally. So. You know, and, and it's really funny because some people get it and some people get rough with it. They both got it right away. They both fell right in for you. saw them sure. running around with us and everything else. And yep. When it was time to wait, they were very patient. And when it wasn't, they just went at it with us. They were, they were great people. They were they're thrilled. I think they had a ball. Yeah, I'm they're not sure, but I think. <laughs> no, no, they're thrilled. Depending on when they turn it on and see what happens. Yeah, then, <laughs> when they see what they look like, that's then right. it's always like, oh. That's right. You're going to get back to Santa Fe? You have more work to do. Roger, I really appreciate you coming down and spending some time with us, Roger Cook. This is a big thrill. I had a great time, and I'm glad to meet you again. And when you come up to right. Boston, look me up. Good to see you. Good Boston see Strong, you. yeah? Yeah, Boston Strong. Right on, brother. That's all the time we have. Thanks for spending your valuable time with us this week. And be sure to catch up with us next week as we once again run down some of the week's biggest issues and the issues you're likely to see in the headlines in the months that follow. Now, we'd also like to bid a fond farewell to NMAF producer Matt Grubbs, who leaves us to take on another adventure in broadcasting. And Matt has made a significant contribution to the station and the community. His enthusiasm, hard work, and talent have very much brought distinction to New Mexico PBS, and we wish him the best. I'm Gene Grant. We'll see you next week in focus.